Well, thanks very much. It's nice to be here. I was glad to see you. Over your door in stone is my name. Engraved in stone. There's a Chief Justice of Canada, 1865 to 95, called Duff, and there is the name Duff above your doorway. I was very impressed by your <laughs> forethought in <laughs> memorising me before I, before I came. So, torts and crimes. I am, I should warn you, no tort lawyer, as will become painfully clear as the paper goes on. I was asked to write a paper on torts and crimes um, for a volume. I thought, okay, I'll learn some tort law. It's going to be good for me to learn some tort law. So I began reading. I started off with a very simple idea. Tort law is about allocating the costs of harm. Easy. Criminal law is quite different from that. But now I read a, a bit of tort law, not enough yet, and things are more complicated. And this paper reflects the complications I've begun to learn about. And I need some more help in finding out where to go from here. So, introduction. Why is this not working? Ah, there we go. Oh, I think I'll fit on the slideshow now. Yes, yeah, so we just got that slideshow. Well, here we are. <laughs> I can move these damn things. Right, introduction. Yes, we're right. We're in business. So, tort law and criminal law, how to understand the differences. There are two, two enterprises here. One enterprise is analytic. How do we analyze these two different types of law? What are the, if any, essential features, if they have any? What are the internal aims? That's not really my concern here. My concern is normative. What kinds of law, certain what kinds of aim or function should we have in a decent legal system? And what role can be played, properly played, by something like tort law and something like criminal law? In the end, I want to ask how we should decide if we were to maintain both kinds of law, tort and criminal, how to allocate labour between them? Which cases should be tort, which criminal, which both? And what are the grounds, what criteria can we appeal to to separate out cases into tort law and criminal law? That's my ultimate interest, which I work towards and end up still not very clear about by the end of the paper, as you'll see. So, to get started though, here's a simple view of tort law and criminal law. My neighbour starts a bonfire, knowing full well the risk it might spread and cause damage to property. It spreads, my garage gets burnt down. I sue for damages, and I'm awarded the cost of repairing the garage, which turns out to be $3,000. Maybe also he's prosecuted by the police for criminal damage, and convicted because he is reckless as to the risk of damage, and the court finds him, quite by chance, $3,000. Same action, same damage, in the end, the same money being paid out. Of course, the $3,000 goes to me in the first case, and to the state in the second case. That's rather important. So. Here are some simple differences between the tort case and the criminal case. The tort case is, of course, controlled by me as the victim, the plaintiff. I decide whether to sue, I decide whether to pursue the case, whether to settle or not, whether to enforce the court's verdict in my favour. It's my case. The criminal case isn't mine. It's brought and controlled by the polity, by it might be the state against my neighbour, or the people against D, or if you're unlucky enough to live in a monarchy, the queen against D, but not me anyway. It's the state or the polity against the defendant. Not my case anymore. The criminal verdict depends on fault. I've got to prove, well, the prosecution must prove that my neighbour was reckless, at least, in causing the damage. And my neighbour might offer some kind of justification or excuse. Well, I had to do it to avoid some greater evil. I was under duress. All that stuff applies in the criminal case. In the court case, all I need to show is he was, in some objective sense, negligent, and that's the end of the story. No further fault need to prove, no justifications, except if you can show it's my fault, no excuses. So fault figures in a big way in the criminal case, in a very small way in the tort case. Thirdly, the damages are determined in the civil case by what's needed to repair the harm. If it costs $3,000 to repair the garage, I get $3,000. If it costs 1,000, I get 1,000. If it costs 15,000, a fancy garage, I get 15,000. In the criminal case, we hope the fine depends upon some judgment of how serious the wrong was, which was partly on what damage was caused, but also on what fault the agent had in causing the damage. And we hope, too, in any sane system, it depends on, my, on the wrongdoer's means. If D is poor, he'll get a rather small fine in cash terms. If he's rich, he should get a rather larger fine in cash terms. So the fine is proportioned both to fault and to means in a way that the tort award is not. The tort award depends just on what it costs to repair my garage. The tort case might be settled pre-trial. 
they often are, without admission to liability. The, the, the insurers get together, right, we have a settlement, he pays two and a half thousand dollars, I sign the forms, no liability admitted, the case settles, no trial. Criminal cases can be settled pre-trial. They typically are settled by guilty pleas without going to a full trial. But guilty pleas are precisely admissions of liability. The defendant must admit liability before the case is finished. So liability is crucial in the criminal case, not in the tort case. We can insure against civil liability, and if we are engaged in some kind of practice like driving, we are required to insure ourselves to make sure that those we injure get paid. Insurance is permissible, maybe mandatory in tort cases, I can't insure against a criminal case. I can't insure against being fined. I pay the fine myself. I can't get insurance to go to jail for me or do my probation for me. I have to do it. There are, of course, punitive damages, but I'll mention those. I'll come back to those later. They're an interesting issue. So these contrasts between the tort case and the criminal case suggest a simple, familiar kind of picture. Tort law is focused on harms. The harm I suffered when my garage burnt down, and how that harm gets repaired, who bears the cost of that harm? Of course, if you believe that tort law must involve fault, only wrongful harms get to be successful tort cases, but still the focus is on the harm and its repair. Criminal law is concerned with wrongs. Maybe if you believe in the harm principle, only, wrong, only harmful wrongs get to be criminal, but still the focus is on wrongs, not just on harms. Tort law is concerned with allocating the costs of harms. The, the harm has been caused, who pays for it? And we ask, well, should we base the allocation on justice or on efficiency? And that's one debate within tort law. But the aim of tort law, on the simple view, is to decide who pays for the harm. Where does the cost fall? Criminal law is concerned with who gets punished for a wrong, who's called to account in the criminal trial, who's punished for the wrong they did. Quite different functions. And if that's the distinction, We've got cost allocation on tort law, punishment according to account in criminal law, harms and wrongs. We can see why those differences are, are there. First of all, if I've suffered harm, it's up to me whether to bother about pursuing it or not. The all matter is who pays for the harm. If I choose to pay myself, fine. So the case is controlled by the plaintiff in the tort case because it's up to the plaintiff whether or not to bother about getting the cost of harm paid for. But if we're dealing with a wrong, a criminal wrong, that is for the polity to decide whether to pursue the person who's violated the shared values that the law reflects. So you can see why, if the contrast between tort law and criminal law is between cost allocation and pursuing wrongdoers, the tort case is controlled by the plaintiff, the criminal case is controlled by the people, by the polity. Likewise, in tort cases, there's a cost that's occurred which must fall somewhere. There's a garage burnt to the ground, someone's got to pay for it. Okay, if we don't have a system of universal insurance, Someone has to pay the cost. So we decide where to, where, to, where to allocate the cost. We might think that fault is going to be less crucial here. Okay, if my neighbour caused the harm with some minimal fault, that's enough to make him the person who bears the cost. But again, if we're dealing with punishment in the criminal case, then fault is crucial. You deserve punishment only if you are a culpable, faulty wrongdoer. So you see why fault doesn't loom so large when you're allocating costs as it does when you're assigning punishment. Again, since it's my case in the tort case, if I choose to settle because it's easier than getting the case to trial, I get enough money to keep me happy, then fine, I can settle and liability isn't crucial. Because the point of the thing, the point of the enterprise is to allocate the cost and we agree that here's where the cost will fall. In the criminal case, the whole point is to assign liability. Who is to blame for this wrong? The defendant is to be either acquitted or convicted. The liability is central to the criminal enterprise. And that's why we can't have settlements in the criminal case which don't admit liability, because that would destroy the point of the process if no liability is assigned. And finally, insurance is sensible. In tort cases, what matters is that the person who suffered the loss gets paid. OK, if you, perhaps the defendant should be the person who pays, but at least the defendant's task might be just to make sure that the plaintiff gets paid. And I make sure of that by taking out insurance. And then I get my insurance in and they pay the money. So I've done my bit. I've, I've made, made sure that if I cause harm, the plaintiff gets paid. What matters is the person, the plaintiff gets paid in the tort case. The insurance makes sense there. In the criminal case, if I am to be censured and punished for my wrongdoing, then I've got to suffer the burden. I can't have someone else do it for me. So insurance makes no sense in the criminal context. Because the whole point of the criminal context is to pick on the wrongdoer, to censure and punish that person who did wrong. Insurance can't do that. 
So far then, so good. My simple model, cost allocation for the who pays for harm, accountability and punishment for wrongs, tort law, criminal law. Two quite different kinds of law, so different purposes, each having its part to play in a civilised life. But there's a difficulty, there's a gap which that model leaves. And we'll see what the gap is and how it might be filled. Here's the gap. So I've been wronged. And what I want to do is not to get someone to pay for some harm, but to call the wrongdoer to account. You've wronged me, I want to get an accounting from you. But then I've got no recourse yet. If I want to bring a tort case against you, I've got to say, here's some harm you caused which you must pay for. So if the tort case was focused not on the wrong, but on the harm, on the cost allocation model. If I look to criminal law, then I lose the case. It's not my case anymore. As Christie put it famously, the criminal law steals the case from me. It becomes the politics case. So if I appeal to the police, they can pr prosecute. But I'm now not myself bringing the case. I'm not now pursuing the wrongdoer for myself. What I, want, what I want to do is pursue the wrongdoer myself, and I can't do that. Two examples make that point. In cases, in contexts, in countries like, certainly in, in Britain, where libel is not a criminal matter, it's a civil matter. If I'm libeled, someone publishes standard ac accusations against me which are false, and I, I want to sue, I want to get satisfaction, I want to call them to account. If I bring a tort case, I'm asking for damages. I'm going to say, look, here's how I was harmed, and I need N thousand dollars to make up for the harm. But that seems to distort what's going on here. What I want isn't what I should want isn't the money. What I want is an accounting, an apology, some kind of reparation for the wrong you did me. And that isn't provided by money which is focused on paying compensation for harm. Because what's at stake here is not the harm. In fact, there is no harm, but the wrong I've suffered. So libel under the cost allocation model doesn't give me what I want, which is according to account for the wrong you did me. Here's another case, which happens, again, certainly in England. Parents whose child dies in hospital due to some negligence by the doctors. Not criminal, it's not bad, serious enough to be criminal, so they want to sue. Well, they sue. And if they win the case, they're rewarded under English law, whatever, okay, there are damages for costs they incurred, but also damages of three and a half thousand pounds, which is what, about six thousand dollars, <coughs> called damages for bereavement. For the loss of your child, you get three and a half thousand pounds. And the parents might complain, look, they say, how dare you value my child's life for three and a half thousand pounds? That's outrageous. And so it is. But why is it outrageous? What they, should, what they should not mean is that the child's life is worth more than that. As if 35,000 or 350,000 might meet the case. That's not what they should be saying. They're not saying we need more money to pay for our child's life. But they're saying that the money isn't what's relevant here. They aren't appealing for the compensation of some, some harm, which will be paid for by money. What they want is an accounting, an apology from the doctor to cause the child's death. That's what they want. And money doesn't provide that. So again, tort law understood as allocating the costs of harm doesn't help the parents in this case, because what they want is not money for harm. They want an apology and accounting from the doctors who caused their child's death. And they're the ones who fall in the gap that those two models leave. They can't use tort law understood as cost allocation that doesn't give them what they want. But criminal law, it ceases to be their case. It becomes a police matter. So here's a way to put the point. On the, tort, on the cost allocation model, what's crucial is that the person who suffered harm gets some money. If it's you're dealing with, typically the award in tort cases is monetary damages. Money either to pay for the harm, if the harm can be paid for, to repair my garage, or pay my medical costs. Or if the harm can't be paid for strictly, at least money which will, simply as money, do something to compensate or make up for what I suffered. Okay, I lost some, I had some harm which can't be fully compensated, but still the money is a kind of consolation. That's the model of a tort law. Well, what it is that I get the money, secondarily, the defendant pays, or they make sure that they have insurance who pay. But the focus is on what I get to make up for, to somehow make up for the harm I suffered, the loss I suffered. That's the model of torts as allocating the costs of harm. Well, matters though for the libel case and the wrongful death case is not that I receive some money, but that I get something from the wrongdoer. An explanation, an apology, some kind of reparation. Though what's crucial in the case of wrongs is that I get something, that the wrongdoer must do something for me. 
And that's not covered by the model which just says what matters, what matters is you get the money to pay for the harm you suffered. So there's the gap. Tort law understood as cost allocation and criminal law understood as the polity pursuing a wrongdoer doesn't leave room for the person who wants, as an individual, to pursue the person who wronged them as a wrongdoer. They seem to fall through the gap between those two models of law. And then I found a revelation to me, which shows my ignorance, a theory called civil recourse, Goldberg and Zipporsky, who offered a new kind of tort law, which gets away from cost allocation towards tort law as focused on wrongs. Look, they say, the point of tort law is to give plaintiffs, to give those who've been wronged, recourse against the wrongdoer, the person who first wronged them. It's still my case. I get to sue my neighbour. I get to sue the person who died with me or killed my child. So it's still me in charge of the case. That's important. But the focus is not now on compensation for harm. The focus is precisely on liability for the wrong. I want to call the person to account for the wrong they did me. And that's the focus of the, of, the, of, the, of the case in tort law on the civil recourse model. The initial task of the court is not to assign damages, but to, work out, to, to decide, is the defendant liable for the wrong that is alleged against them? Is my neighbour liable for destroying my garage? Are you liable for libeling me? And so on. So the focus of the case on the civil recourse model is on assigning liability for the wrong. I call the person to account for the wrong I claim they did me. Okay, then at a second stage, if the person is liable, then the question is what remedy to, 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 to award me? And it will normally be a remedy will normally consist in some monetary award. In the garage case and the libel case and the wrongful death case, maybe the remedy will be a monetary award. But as we'll see shortly, if we're dealing with accounting for wrongs, as on this model we are, the meaning of the award is quite different from its meaning in the cost allocation model. So, Gildersky, I call it a short. So this isn't a kind of existing tort law. Tort law, as we have it, is civil recourse. That's at least controversial. Um, other tort theories say, don't be stupid, it's not any, nothing like that. It's to do with allocating costs or whatever. I'm not going for that, that debate. I can't engage myself because I'm not an expert in the question of whether, of what they offer, whether what they offer is a decent account of our existing tort law. The question is, is it attractive as a normative model of a kind of law we ought to have? a kind of law which gives individuals a way to call to account those who've wronged them. And if it is plausible normatively, then how does it relate to criminal law? What role does it play in relation to criminal law? But as I thought about it, I became puzzled by various features of civil recourse. It seemed at first sight very attractive, but two things about it became puzzling. And in two ways, it seems to me it ends up much closer to criminal law than its proponents think. And this will be important, I hope. So, first of all, the accounting. Civil recourse involves me calling to account a person who I think wronged me. That's a central notion, is calling to account. In that case, then, settlements without admitting liability have no part to play in this kind of model, because if I'm calling to account, what matters is that you admit, or the court finds, that you are liable for the wrong you did me. So finding liability is crucial to civil recourse. So settlement, settlements without admitting liability seem to destroy the point of the enterprise. So civil recourse has no real room for settlements which involve no mission of liability, which are prominent in tort law, it should be noted. Secondly, an accounting is calling someone to account. I call you to account for the wrong you did me. If I call you to account, you must be able to account for yourself. You must be competent to appear as a defendant and answer for yourself. If through some misfortune, you've become so disordered you can't understand what's going on. If you're in a state where you would, in a criminal case, be unfit to plead, unfit to be tried, then accounting seems impossible. I can't call you to account if you can't account for yourself. So whereas in tort law, understood as cost allocation, if the defendant's now insane, that doesn't stop the case. So we sort of decide that he caused harm and should pay the cost. In civil recourse, you must have a defendant who is able, who is fit to give an account of themselves, fit to answer. If you don't have that, then again, the process can't function as it should. So unfitness to plead, unfitness to answer, bars a criminal trial. It would also bar a, tri bar a case in civil recourse. Thirdly, what kind of account can the defendant give? In tort law as we have it, and tort law on the cost allocation model, 
the kinds of justification or excuse which figure in criminal law don't figure. I might say, look, I had to damage your property out of necessity. I tied my ship to your dock, the ship damaged your dock, but given the storm that was looming, I was justified in what I did. But still, the court says, if you cause the damage, then you pay for the harm. So justifications which would, in criminal law, get me acquitted, don't bar me, don't bar me having to pay the costs, the damage, in tort law. So too, I say, look, I was under duress, that should be an excuse in criminal law, in the right kind of case, but wouldn't be a defence in a cost allocation model of tort law. But again, if I want you to, give an, to account for the harm you caused me, the wrong you did, I call you to account, then surely it matters, it should matter, what account you can give. And if your account is, look, I was justified, or look, I was under duress, or look, I was insane, that should make a difference to how, how I now respond to you. So if, I'm, if, I'm, if I'm calling you to account, I must listen to the account you give. If the account is, well, I was justified or excused, that must not be relevant in civil recourse in a way it's not relevant in cost allocation. So again, in this way too, civil recourse is more like criminal law. Defences become relevant to the case because they're the way in which I can account for myself, account for what I did. In a way, it should at least exculpate me. I might still have to pay for it, but still, I shouldn't I be blamed for it. And you should recognise that I now was justified or excused in, in wronging you. So in these ways then, civil recourse looks rather like criminal law. Also, that's, that's, that's the accounting. Think now about the remedy. So the court finds you liable. In the civil recourse model, the court finds you liable as having done me a wrong, which will recognise as a wrong, which I now entitled to some remedy. And the court awards me monetary damages, which is a typical remedy in tort cases. How can that kind of remedy, how can that kind of payment remedy the wrong you caused me? If the aim is to get a remedy for a wrong, not to get harm paid for, but get a wrong remedied, how can money do that? What the wrong requires, surely? You have to say, what, what, do, what do wrongs require to make up for them? They require recognition and apology. What I want is to say, yes, I see I wronged you and I'm sorry. That's what I'm looking for. And perhaps an explanation of how you came to do it, an accounting and answering for what you did which involves an apology for what you now see was a wrong you did me. Now, of course, insurers can't do that for me. Insurers can't apologise for me for what I did to you. That wouldn't make sense. Right. But how can money figure here? Take first the case where the, wrong, the wrongfulness is quite trivial. Okay, you, were, you, were, you, were, you were careless, you were negligent. It's not a big deal, as wrongs go. But you cause some substantial harm. You see, in that case, an appropriate way to make up for the wrong is say, look, I'm sorry, and I'll pay for the damage. That's all that's needed, an apology and payment for the damage I caused. Even though you might think that if it's to make up for the wrong, then the money should come from me, not from my insurers. But perhaps if I say, OK, I've made sure that I'm insured, and I apologise to you, that could be enough. So maybe the only remedy is an apology plus the cost of the harm that needs to be repaired where the harm can be repaired by, by, by money, where money was paid for the cost of the new garage. How about the case like libel or the child's death, where the, there isn't a harm which can be repaired by money? Even here, it might be that a payment makes sense as an award. Because when the court says to the defendant, not just you're liable, but also, and you must pay $10,000, that's where giving rather, a rather more forceful content with judgment that you've done wrong. You're told you've got to pay for it, and what you pay is this amount of dollars. And like in paying the money to me, the defendant can make, they must be expressing an apology in a more forceful way. I'm sorry, and to show I'm sorry, I'll give you this money as a token of my apology. So if the money is seen now, not simply as a monetary sum I get, but what the wrongdoer pays to me as <coughs> reparation, it starts to make a kind of sense as a way of remedying a wrong. Maybe. If that's right, then all damages in tort cases are, in an important sense, punitive. Theory say, look, there are, punitive da there are alternate damages, and then as a separate class, there are punitive damages. When you go wrong, which was malicious or intentional, then the court might award damages for the, to pay for the harm, and also an extra sum, a huge sum often, so-called punitive damages. But on my account, our civil recourse, all damages are punitive, because they're imposed on a wrongdoer by an authority, that's what punishment is. They're imposed for the wrong the person did. 
you're liable for the wrong, and here's what the court awards as damages for that wrong. And they're intended to be, they must be meant to be burdensome, because the point of the damages now is to make up for the wrong. They can do that only if they give expression to the apology I'm owed, which requires they be burdensome. But you, must, you, you have to pay for the wrong you did, and the paying must be something which is burdensome. If that's right, then all damages are, in a sense, punitive. They're burdens imposed on wrongdoers to make up to their victims for the wrong they did. And then so-called punitive damages are, if you like, cases of aggravation. You've got the basic wrong, causing, causing harm. It's aggravated by the malice it was done with. And that gives you an aggravated punishment of aggravated punitive damages. But still, every award of damages is there to provide civil recourse, is there to provide a remedy for wrong, must be punitive. You might sort of wonder why money is appropriate here. Because money is liable to distort. It's as if you could pay for the child's death by an award of $70,000. But surely children's lives can't be paid for one. So money still seems to be perhaps a distortion. But you ask, well, what could a court award that would be appropriate as a way of making reparation? Bearing in mind that we're dealing here with relations between citizens of a rather formal kind. We relate it as citizens, not as friends or intimates, but as strangers. What can the court do which will preserve that distance between us, which the law must preserve, but yet somehow mark the wrong you did? And money has the attraction of being a rather formal, abstract mode of exchange, which you can express something about your apology without getting too intimate. And that seems important. Like money can play a role here as a rather abstract or formal expression of the wrong, uh, an apology for the wrong you did me. If that's all right, and of course, since I'm short of time, I've had to assert rather than argue and gesture rather than explain, but I can happily explain in questions. We now have three models of law on the table. We've got, sorry, yes, that's right. So civil recourse, as I'm saying, is rather more like criminal law than Goldersky acknowledge. That's a summary of what I said, said just now, that the accounting is more like a criminal accounting, the remedies are more like punishments. It's had to serve the aims of civil recourse. So civil recourse seems to be an interesting understanding of tort law, an interesting model of law, which is distinct both from cost allocation tort law and from criminal, criminal punishment, criminal law. Though it's closer to criminal law in certain respects. The question is now, We've got, so we've got cost allocation tort law, we've got civil recourse, and we've got criminal law. Do we need all three? And if so, how do we divide the labour between them? Let me skip, because I'm getting short of time. You're doing okay for time. Good. Thank you. We do need some way to allocate the costs of harm, unless we just leave them to fall where they, where, where they fall, which seems unfair. We could have a system of universal insurance, which I told New Zealand has some version of. You pay the premiums, and then anyone who's harmed gets the compensation, and maybe your premiums are adjusted if you've caused the harm or you had no claims. So we could look, look at a system which has no individual liability, simply insurance. If we don't have that, then maybe we do need some way of allocating the cost of harm away from those who innocently suffer it towards those who've caused it through some kind of faulty performance. So we need something like cost allocation. The question is, could we have that now simply as part of a civil recourse pattern? If I call you to account for a wrong, can I at the same time be seeking compensation for the cost you incur I incurred? Maybe you could conflate cost allocation and civil recourse into one, 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 one legal process. My real concern, though, is with civil recourse and criminal law. So the law recognises certain kinds of wrong as legally recognisable. They're wrongs which the law thinks you should, the law should take note of. Given such a wrong, then there is going to be room for civil recourse. I could bring a case against you and say, look, you wronged me in the way the law recognises, I call you to account for the wrong. So civil recourse is relevant and appropriate whenever there is a legally recognised wrong. That seems clear enough. And civil recourse gives the person who's been wronged the power to hold the wrongdoer to, a, wrongdoer to account, which is an important power to have. It gives power over that aspect of our lives, a way of getting, getting recourse from those who wrong us. That's worth having. But why then do we also need criminal law? Why should we say that some wrongs are not just civil wrongs, but also criminal wrongs, which are pursued not by the individual victim, but by the polity? And which lead not just to an award of damages, but to punishment, which would include imprisonment or other kinds of burdensome imposition. 
Why criminal law as well as civil recourse? We might look at the outcomes. Okay, the outcome of a criminal process is punishment which goes beyond damages. Punishment existing in imprisonment or probation or community service or other kinds of burden. So we need to ask about the aims of punishment. Are we dealing with retribution or deterrence or rehabilitation or incapacitation or what we might say insofar as those are our aims. Insofar as we should be aiming to impose retribution on those who do wrong or aiming to deter wrongdoers or incapacitate them, those aims are ones we should pursue collectively because they are our collective aims. So I think insofar as so we might say that the wrong should be criminal when there's a kind of wrong which requires retribution, if any do. Or the kinds of wrong we should collectively seek to deter or prevent by, by, by penal means. That's one answer to how we should decide what cases, what wrongs to criminalise. We have to think about what the outcome of criminalising is. So it's those wrongs which require that kind of outcome, those wrongs which require retribution, deterrence and so on. That's one kind of answer. Focus on the outcomes of the two kinds of case. In the one hand, damages to the person who's been wronged. In the other case, punishment. We should criminalise those wrongs which require punishment where requiring punishment is a matter of retribution or deterrence or whatever we think the aim, aims of punishment are. But I won't start on that debate right now. We could also ask whose wrong it is. Is it my wrong or is it our collective wrong? Some wrongs, of course, can't be pursued by the victim. Some victims can't sue. They're incapacitated or they're dead. So it's all their wrong, but someone needs to sue on their behalf, perhaps. That's a role for the polity as a whole, to take over the wrong in the victim's name. Sometimes the only victim is the whole polity. That's actually actually many crimes. Think of crimes of endangerment, where there's no particular person who's endangered or harmed. Various kinds of driving offence, various kinds of environmental offence have no particular victim. But we're all endangered. Or crimes which involve some kind of damage to or abuse of our, our institutions. Various kinds of tax fraud, social security fraud and so on. All these wrongs, there's no victim other than us collectively. So there, of course, we will collectively pursue the wrongdoer. We don't think too with some wrongs, we don't think we shouldn't leave the victim to bear the burden of pursuing the wrong for themselves. We should help, we should join in and say that we'll bring the wrong, we'll, we'll bring the case with you, for you, in your name. Because you've been, you've been raped, you've been seriously assaulted, it shouldn't be up to you to go through the, the moral, emotional burden of bringing the case. We should do it with you and for you. That's one model of criminal law, we do it on behalf of the victim. But note in that kind of case, if that's the rationale, we do it to set, set, spare the victim the burden. And then the victim's consent is crucial to the enterprise. We do it because that's what you want, and we'll do it for you. But of course, criminal law, and this is the central kind of criminal case, it seems to me, is a crime where whether the case goes, goes ahead depends not on you, the victim, but on us collectively, on the prosecutor deciding whether to prosecute or not. The core kind of criminal case is where whether the prosecution goes ahead is not up to the victim but up to a collective decision by the prosecutor or the police. A good example here, which has recently been in the controversy, is, is domestic violence. Prosecutors must make, make, make a policy of prosecuting domestic violence even when the victim says they don't want it. Maybe because the victim they think is unable to decide rationally, or perhaps even then. So that's again controversial, but I mean, the key defining feature of a, a sort of central criminal case when we criminalise conduct, we're saying that we will decide collectively whether to prosecute. It's not up to the victim now to decide whether to prosecute or not. And that's the hallmark of criminal law in its core meaning. It becomes we take over the case and the victim loses their definitive say on whether it goes ahead or not. If that's right, the question then is, end of slideshow, which kinds of crime are those? Which kinds of wrong are such that we should say collectively, like it or not, we'll prosecute this? That was the question I meant to answer when I began working on this paper. But I got involved in the complications of tort law and civil recourse, so that's the question I'll leave you with instead. Thank you. So we have time for a bit of a Q&A, so we'll start over here. Uh, so my, my question is, is, I think, well, I want to say it very politely, but I think you have a very attenuated view of what tort law is. I think a very mistaken view, actually, of what uh, tort law, tort law is. So one of the first things I teach my students is that tort law is not synonymous or coextensive with harm because there are lots of torts in which harm is not a requirement 
uh, to prove the torts, and there are lots of harms which are, in fact, not torts, uh, very serious uh, harms which are not torts. And we have you know, fancy Latin expressions, Dem and Sign and Uria, to explain that uh, to the students. So I just think that this whole presentation, the foundation of it, is, is, is very shaky, that you have a, misunder, a misguided or misunderstood uh, version of tort law that you're putting up in, in comparing to the criminal law. If I said, here is the kind of tort law, you'd be right. As I made clear at the start, my aims are normative rather than analytic. I think, what kinds of law do we need? Here's one model of law, allocating the costs of harm. Here's one model of law, civil recourse for those who've been wronged. Both seem to have their part to play. I was actually not trying to say, here's what tort law is. I, I claim expertise in that, and I'm sure you're right. That if, that, I, if, if I said, that's what tort law is, you'd be right to laugh at me. That wasn't what I claimed. I said, here's a model of law. here are two models of law. Each of which seems attractive and seems to play an important function. And we do we need both of these? I'm not only saying, do we need only these? I'm saying, do we need both of these? And if we do need both of these, we also need criminal law. So I think that that's... Well, you said it right, if my aim had been to describe or explain tort law as it exists, but that wasn't my aim. Yes, you're right, that's an important point which I didn't touch on. Okay, so for good reason in the criminal case we require proof beyond reasonable doubt of the person's guilt. Um, the good reason being in part we shouldn't impose the burdens of punishment and censure on, the, on someone without being sure they're guilty. So criminal cases clearly you get a very stringent burden of proof on the prosecution. If we're dealing with simply allocating the costs of harm on that model, then we can see why the burden of proof would be less heavy. Because someone's got to pay the cost of harm. The cost must fall somewhere, so we have to say, we have to say where it's most likely to, be, to fall rightly. So on a case which is aiming to decide just where, who pays for the cost of harm, then we can see why the burden of proof would be still on the plaintiff, but a lower, but a lower standard of proof is required. But if we're dealing with civil recourse, if I'm accusing you of wronging me, then it's not clear which way we should go on that. Um, as you say, supposing I'm acquitted in the criminal case, and then supposing civil recourse is a reality in our law, and the victim says, ah, okay, I'll bring a civil recourse case, and the burden of proof then is only the balance of probabilities, I get acquitted in the criminal case, and then find liable in the civil case, and that seems unreasonable. So maybe you're, so maybe you're right, maybe if we gave the civil recourse, as Goldersky presented, as a county for wrongs, then you would need to have the same standard of proof as in criminal cases. It can get tricky, but certainly in some Scandinavian countries, there's a kind of combination of the criminal cases brought and the victim joins in as a party, seeking now some kind of damages. And it can happen that the court acquits the defendant on the criminal charge, finds for the plaintiff on the civil case and awards damages. And the European court says, that's fine, um, that's how it goes. So anyway, there is a tension there. Um, once we bring together the notion, that one, once we bring together the, the, the two kinds of cases, both focusing on a wrong, you see, we should have the same burden of proof, the same standard of proof in each kind of case. So, do you think it will be better to com combine the civil, uh, the civil recourses with the criminal cases, or just separate them? I'm inclined to think. Yeah. That will be that will not have a problem of the se mm. second accusations. Mm. I'm inclined to think you're right that we should have only one for each alleged wrong, only one case, either a criminal case or a civil case, or maybe you can imagine hybrid systems. So, okay, so some cases, if you want to sue, you sue. 
it's up to you, the criminal has no part to play. Some cases, uh, the pure criminal, then whether the case is prosecuted depends entirely on the prosecuting authority. In between, you may say there are some cases which you find a version of in some continental systems where the case will go ahead as a criminal case only if the victim requests it or only if the victim consents. So it'll still be a criminal case, but the victim has a say in whether it goes ahead or not. So that still gives you just only one case, and that means your worry. But it gives, gives the victim some role, a formal role, in, in the process. Thank you, you're right, that be, if we had two distinct processes, each focused on a alleged wrong, and in one you get convicted and punished only if proved guilty beyond reasonable doubt, in the other you can be found liable for the same cause of action, liable for a civil wrong, on responsibility. That seems uneasy. So maybe we, sh maybe we should avoid that. Um, if there is a determination based on this framework that, that there is a necessary space for a third way of civil recourse, could you speak a little bit more about the economics of litigation in that field as, as opposed to criminal litigation, which is largely funded by the state, or civil litigation, for law, as you explained it, which would be funded by this cost allocation method? I can speculate. Um, I'm inclined to think that legal aid, i.e. funded by, by the state, should extend beyond the criminal law to, certainly to civil recourse kinds of cases. So if I've been, if I think I've been wrong, I can make at least a plausible case I've been wrong, then I should be able to find um, legal representation without having to fund it myself, or find lawyers who would take it on as a, um, as a risk. That's, that, that's my, my first thought about the matter, but I haven't thought it through, I must confess. Um, but again, it's usually, if the point of civil recourse, which is how Goldersky was interested, is to give those who've been wrong the power to pursue the wrongdoer and get an accounting, then that power must be an effective power. So we can't say, look, you can have the power only if you can afford to pay for it yourself. So we need to make sure that somewhere, either by arranging for lawyers to do it on a contingency basis, or arranging a decent system of legal aid, which anyway there is good reason for. People might see that like returning to a system of equity, since it's like a second system uh, to correct an, an initial wrong by the current system. And that'd be worrying because. Well, I'm assuming there are reasons that we abandoned the system of equity <laughs> <laughs> that were valid. <laughs> Maybe that's not your view. Not yet. I need to hear what the reasons are. Um, tell me more about why this would, why this should worry me. I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> sorry. I, I, sorry I, I don't know enough about equity law to know why that should worry me. So if someone can tell me why it should worry me, then I'll start being worried. <laughs> so there, we've got a talk. Um, if you're talking about a normal model of um, having civil recourse to hold somebody who's harming you to account, I think implicit within that is that as you said, it's not just about money, it's about that person specifically saying to me that they are liable for what they've done. And underneath that is the idea that they should be apologizing to me personally. But the law can compel you to say, I'm sorry, but I don't think as a victim, if I feel like I've been wrong, then I get that person forced to say those words. It has the same impact as someone who's voluntarily saying those words. And if that's the purpose for civil recourse and not um, money or then I'm, I'm not sure that that would render any more satisfaction to the victim than the current uh, legal system that we have. Yeah, that's a fair point. Um, that's an important point. There are two dimensions to the civil recourse model. One is the court's finding that this person is liable, and the court's award to me of whatever the, the award. And in doing that, the court is already sending out a certain message to me and to the wrongdoer and to everyone else, saying, yes, you wronged him, he was wronged, and here's what you owe, you owe him an apology. So that message r remains, whatever the wrongdoer does. And that's really important. But you're right, also, as I said, the point of the damages is meant to be, in part at least, that here's how the wrongdoer expresses an apology. And we all know that wrongdoers can do that legally without being remotely sincere about it. They pay because they've got to pay, they say, I'm sorry, um, I may say it in a certain tone, even though they do it orally. Um, the question then is how worthwhile is 
the ritual of apology. There's no ritual here. The court says, here's what you must do, and the defendant does it not. Certainly it's, it's required of them, they do it unwillingly, because if they don't, they'll get bit, suffer such some further consequence. Um, but still there is a ritual there which they go through. And I think myself that in this, con in this con and also in the context of punishment, rituals are important as aspects of our social life. And again, we're dealing here not with our relations to friends or intimates in those contexts, sincerity at all. If it's sincere, it's not worth it's not worth a thing. But that's not the context of, of, of the law. We're dealing here with our relations simply as citizens. We're in a rather distant, detached relationship to each other as citizens. Like in that context, rituals are important. Um, okay, it's a bit nicer the person meant it. That's, that, 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 that's the ideal, but still, there's something worthwhile sort of about going through the ritual, which a person does, of apology. So you're right, so you, you're right to raise the question that apology seems to bring with it a whole requirement for sincerity and meaning which the court can't provide. But I think the ritual can still play an important part. Time for a few more questions. Denise? Um, thanks very much for your, your talk. Um, I do like the idea of the civil recourse, but one of the things that sticks with me, and I don't know if you follow it all, the Canadian system, but there's been increased issues around, for example, women who wear the niqab and the dynamics that that creates when they're bringing um, charges or when charges are laid against people because of the wish to remain under the niqab. But I think it indicates a larger issue, which is some survivors, victims of crime, do not seek that personal apology, do not want any more closeness with um, the perpetrators. And so the question is, by, in, by putting in a new system that includes civil recourse, are you not, in, in giving that power, taking away power from the other current systems? And so therefore, it becomes a greater interest to criminals to go after people who aren't as willing to engage in that type of civil recourse and people who aren't as comfortable engaging and bringing in that type of punitive response. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. And you're right, so, okay, so one obvious danger would be that we get a kind of privatizing of crime. So, okay, you can bring a case, so don't, don't bother us. And that was, but that seems to be, would be a serious obstacle. And that's why I said that if we ask what kinds of case would be criminal, <coughs> One asks me, well, should the victim have to bear the burden of bringing the case themselves? Or should we say that we'll, we'll, we'll bring it? And that seems to be absolutely crucial. So we have to ask which kinds of wrong should we say, look, that's up to you. If you want to sue, sue. If you don't want to sue, don't. Entirely your business. In asking that question, we we'll ask, well, okay, now how is the person placed to sue or not to sue? And to the degree in which the person is disadvantaged or vulnerable or likely to be under pressure, then that's a reason for making the case criminal rather than purely civil. Um, so I, I agree there is that, that, there is that, that, that worry. Um, it's one thing we, we can address by thinking seriously about what kinds of cases do require to be taken over by us collectively rather than being left to the individual victim. And then we ask, if we want to do that, then we ask, okay, what role, how far should we then give a formal role to the victim within what's now the criminal process, or how far is it purely the criminal process without any formal role for the victim? So yes, I agree that, that would be a, a serious worry, but I think it can be, well, in principle we can avoid it. In practice, it's something to, to, to be alert for. Because there, would, there, there would, might then be pressure of various kinds. Another thing is to do with saving costs, of course, to shove cases towards the civil side. So we have time for about one or two more questions. Um, so I'm not sure I, 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 I believe what I'm, I'm about to say, it's tense, but I, 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 I wonder if there's a way to think about civil recourse, and I don't mean to necessarily be representing Risky, uh, I might be, um, where the availability of insurance isn't quite the problem uh, that you suggested, and, and maybe this is just a small point, or maybe it's deep. I'm not sure. uh, so suppose the claim isn't just that I'm, I'm, I'm to call that it, is, it doesn't merely get expressed in the idea that you call people account for the wrong simpliciter, but you ask people to sort of clean up the messes they have made. You hold them. Here's a. Here's a. The world is worse off, and we want the person who made it worse off to be the person who takes responsibility for it. So it's, it's got the civil recourse feel, but, but it, the, the essentialness of the loss is somehow built into the idea. Uh, so that might explain why we wouldn't want to give up tort law for generalized insurance, because we would lose the ability to hold the persons who, who 
bill to uh, cause the loss responsible for it, but it might make personal insurance still permissible because you could say, well, look, uh, I want to be a responsible person and I want to be able to clean up after the messes I make. Uh, and one of the things I might do is try not to make as many messes, but one of the things I might do is insure myself against the possibility. And so I'm still, I'm still responsible for it, it's just I, you know, I've taken the precaution for it. Um, and so if we, so I'm not sure I buy all that, but <laughs> there's a slightly attenuated version of civil recourse, which I think makes private insurance okay, but the New Zealand model is still suspect. And I think that's part of the motivation I can see there are ways of trying to, trying to well, we have a nuance or fudge the difference between the yeah. two models. Um, that's one. But still, I think it's all a matter of what the focus is. Is it really on making sure that the mess gets cleared up? Yeah. Question two, okay, by whom is the second question. Yeah. Or is it really on making sure that you answer for your mess, even if that turns out to be less sufficient as we're getting mess cleared up than the first round might have been? Um, it's, and that's one issue. The other issue is about constantly messes, messes and wrongs. Yeah. Um, it's been important to the Goldberg model that we're dealing with wrongs. Yeah. Um, and like there, that seems to me to be less room for your kind of, your kind of nuance. Messes, you know, not all messes are wrongs. We're just about out of time, Professor F. I just want to thank you so much for coming. Well, thank you. Criminal and tort were probably my two favorite courses in law school. My apologies, Professor. Until Campbell. now, you mean. So it was excellent uh, <laughs> to have your talk. And I mean, you held everyone's attention without a single thought about the state of Florida, where a lot of minds are. <laughs> or maybe just mine. But anyways, thank you so much from the Distinguished well, thank Speakers you very much. and the Student Legal Society. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thanks so much. Thank you, thank you all.